Well, hello, I'm Robert Wolanski, the Communications Director for Heritage Auctions, and I'm delighted today to be with Joe Maddalena, our Senior Vice President, to talk about the world of entertainment. It is a, a category in which I have great passion, <laughs> a great interest, because certainly who hasn't wanted to own a prop, a costume from a favorite movie or television show? And we're going to discuss what the last year has been like in that category. Joe has his hands in many of our categories, so... Uh, if you have questions for Joe, feel free to ask them here at StreamYard, and we'll ask them. I'll ask them to Joe. If you want to ask them anonymously, ask them at TommyN at HA.com, and they'll be fed to me as well. But for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, let's talk about the world of entertainment. Hey, Joe. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Excellent. So this is, uh, look, this is uh, coming up on your first uh, year anniversary here at Heritage. That's right. January. <laughs> it's uh, it's been a whirlwind since it's you've been, been here. Whirlwind. It's been a whirlwind. We've uh, we, we're really happy to have brought the um, uh, entertainment division some uh, life and you know new material. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, when you came, uh, obviously you were in uh, Profiles in History. That's the company you founded, run it for a very long time, twenty some odd 30, 30. 35 years. Yeah. A TV star, <laughs> a beloved figure. Cable. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to uh, streaming <laughs> right. you know, on real television, <laughs> real so I television. think what you're trying to get at. Small screen. But I think what we're trying to talk about, what has it been like? Because certainly, you know, Heritage has had a, a long history of entertainment auctions, but certainly that's the world from which you had come. That's the world in which you had a real interest, a real passion, a real knowledge, and real connections. So what has the transition been like for you in terms of the last year here at Heritage? You know, it's been, you know, we've had our challenges learning the systems because it, it basically the companies operate similar, yeah. but like, you know, we do things differently in terms of production and design, but we figure it all out. The, sure. back, the back end has worked its way out. What's been, I guess, the most rewarding thing is um, just we're able to bring across material that hasn't been available um, on Heritage's site before. Right. You know, so my... Um, our auctions, because I was focused on only six or seven categories, on like 41 categories here, they were all events. Right. You know, we'd work on something for six months. That's all we would do. So our sole focus, you know, so here you got <laughs> 700 of those going on, right? So it's a lot. Of, it's, that's the difference, right. you know, and, you know, trying to carve your niche out amongst that. But I will say that, you know, I think we've done, I don't know. Twenty-five million dollars in the first year, yeah. you know, in, in sales, you know, between uh, entertainment, guitars. I mean, it's been a really. Um, if you look back and just think of what we've accomplished in terms of Neil Schoen and John Azarian and the Marilyn Monroe dresses. Right. I mean, it's pretty remarkable, you know, the the material. Well, let's let's get right to it because I do want to talk about all of those things you just mentioned. But we most recently had the John Azarian and Kevin Burns. We'll get to both of those in just a moment. But I wanted to start with Azarian because I was incredibly excited. One of the few times I've taken a picture <laughs> holding something while I've been at Heritage for the last few years was the Star Trek phaser from Where No Man Has Gone Before. One of my uh, favorite props from one of my favorite TV shows used just the one time in the Star Trek second pilot. It sold for $615,000 just a few weeks ago. You know, Azarian certainly is a collector you've known very well. In fact, uh, I believe before you got here, you actually had an Azarian sale at Profile. Yep, part one, yep. So let's talk a little bit about John. Let's talk about his collection. Let's talk about that phaser and why it did so well. You and I were talking a little while ago before we started about the fact that props always do better than costumes. But certainly we'll see in just a moment that some costumes have done very well. Yeah. So let's talk about that prop because I think it took us all, caught us all off guard a little bit by how well it did. Yeah, I think like going back to John Azarian, um, I met John in 1995. Mm -hmm. Um, he bid in my very first auction. He bought a Batman and Robin costume owned by, uh, worn by a Adam West and Burt Ward. That's what got him into collecting. That's what got him into collecting. He paid $25,000 for it. <laughs> <laughs> After the auction, he called me up yelling at me like, I overpaid. You know, it was so funny. It's like I always, I always give him a hard time about this because he overpaid for the Batman and Robin costume. We got almost seven hundred thousand dollars for them later, so um, he was fine. But <laughs> but it's good that you took care of it. Yeah, yeah. But it was more about like um, the journey of a lot of these people come into your life and you become friends. Yeah. I mean, John and Donna, and you know, growing up with his kids, and you know, I mean, uh, you know, you're talking about decades of friendship, right? So it becomes. The, the the line gets a little blurred at times because you know it does become business. But again, the expectations on his part put a lot of pressure on me because 
I want to make sure that I've at least given him every opportunity to succeed. Right. The phaser rifle, um, God, it's got to be, it has to be one of the coolest things ever. Right. I mean, to me, it's like a Darth Vader helmet, the phaser rifle, they're up there, like of like the holy grails of that genre of collecting. And uh, we did not sell it the first time, another auction company did, and um, I was sad, uh, we missed it. Um, and it's one of the things we always are, we, when we don't get something, we're sad as auctioneers. Um, but it's a thing that nobody knew existed. No one existed. It, before it came out to the auction the first time, everyone thought it had disappeared. I had handled Herb Solo's collection. Herb was a really good friend. Um, and Matt Jeffries and um, Bob Justman, who were basically the, the, the three guys intricately involved with the creation of Star Trek with Desilu in the day. Herb was the executive in production who actually bought Star Trek in and convinced Lucy and Desi to make it. Right. And uh, Herb had told me the story that it was used basically on Mission Impossible in Star Trek and then just disappeared. Like nobody knew. Right. Well, we, now we know why it was specifically made, taken home. It was it, it, the backstory is amazing of where, whence it came, right? Yeah. So it comes back in John's collection, and obviously it is the centerpiece of his collection this time in part two. And um, you know we're always nervous. I mean, you're talking about still something that is starting at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? It's still like you're talking about a significant amount of money. Right. So you know, as auctioneers, we're always kind of like. What's going to happen? You know, it's like, and I remember sitting in the auction room and John texts me, what do you think right before the lot comes up? And I'm just like, you know, I'm, it's like in real time, it's kind of one of those surreal moments. It's like, we're going to find out. And then it's kind of like, it slowly starts. And Mike Sadler is, God, the best auctioneer I've ever worked with. Such a great auctioneer. And he just, it's 250, 275, 300. And then, then it, you get into what the auction magic you know, there's no other, there's nothing like sitting in the room when the auctioneer is fully invested and you've got bidding. Right. It's just like, it's like the ultimate rush. It's like going 200 miles an hour in a Ferrari, right? And $500,000 when Sadler called that, it was just amazing. So I was, you know, uh, it's just one of those, that's why we do this. That's yeah. why, that's why we <laughs> do these crazy jobs. You know, I'm interested. Does the... Every part of the story impacts its value. Certainly the fact that it's a one-off, the fact that it is the, the, the thing that proved to Desilu, to NBC, that Star Trek could be an action series, not just an intellectual series. Given the fact that it was the, its inventor had just died a couple of weeks before the auction, same guy who, directed, who, who created the Game of Life. There are so many different pieces to it, John's owning of it, the fact that it disappeared, what impacts it the most? Is it simply the rarity, the scarcity, the fact that this is that one-off piece? Or you know, David Hall, you know, selling his T206 baseball right. cards, their pedigree, because a collector put a lot of energy into collecting and exhibiting and a lot of pride of ownership. Um, I think entertainment memorabilia is still grossly undervalued. And I'm not a big proponent of investments in collectibles. I, I don't go down that path. But if you look around and see $1.6 million video games and $400,000 Pokemon cards, which I sell, <laughs> you know, um, phaser rifle looks kind of cheap. Well, that's exactly it. It's a, in fact, this is a conversation I have with the sports guys all the time. Cards sell for millions. A jersey sells for a few hundred thousand. That's the tool of the trade. That's a thing that was worn by that hero whose card you're collecting for significantly more than that memorabilia. Why is that? <sighs> Baseball cards are uh, an intrinsic part of uh, our society. You know, we grew up with them. You know, whether what incarnation you grew up with them. I grew up with them in the 60s. Some people grew up with them in the 80s. Some people grew up with them in the 30s and 40s. It was... It, it it just was something that, like comic books, that if you got the bug, it just kind of stayed with you. Yeah. You know, they, they really mean something. And the fact that baseball cards, you can compete to have the best condition sets. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's registries. So there's, there's, there's a lot of in-depth collecting. Somebody once said to me, I have this collection of Fatty Arbuckle material. And I'm like, well, he's like, what do you think? I said, I think it's super important. It's valuable. I'm like, no. And he's like, you said it's important. I said, it is. It's really important. Fatty Arbuckle is really important, but he's not collected anymore. 
And, you know, like some things fade into obscurity. And the guy said to me, why is that? And I thought about it and I'm like, you know, sometimes when material is so rare, you can't collect. So like if you want a 52 Mickey Mantle rookie jersey, how many are there? Right. Let's say there are four in the whole world, okay? You can't have hundreds of collectors. But if you have a 52 Topps Mickey Mantle rookie card, there are thousands of them. So you can have thousands of collectors. That's the difference. So when you get into these things that are these mass produced things where there's a lot of them, more people can collect them. If you want to collect Star Trek and you want the phaser rifle, there's one. Right. <laughs> it's gone. You ain't getting it, right? So you have to collect something else. So now what do you go to? I think that I think that goes into a lot of it. I think you're you're just seeing a simple function of people like to collect. Yeah. So we all we also sold in uh, the summer, July, the two hundred fifty thousand dollar Type Two Hero Phaser from Star Trek as well, which did remarkably well. Yes. And again, that's a prop. That's a thing that was held by if not Shatner or Nimoy, then certainly somebody on the show was one of the key props. We've talked a lot about hero versus, you know, a, a background prop. How significant is it when something like a hero comes up? You know, the closer you get to something used on screen that you can place into an actor or actress's hand, and you can actually screen match it, is like the highest level. Right. Okay. It's, it's, it, it, that's what we're looking for because it, this is still very subjective. You're dealing with, um, like especially in the 60s, this was not high tech. The colors aren't quite registered correctly. Greens might be blues. I mean, so there's a lot of anomalies just in trying to screen match things that you might not see or you might think that are there that aren't there. So yeah, when you can put something like the phaser rifle particularly, because there's one, right. you know that's it, right? When you get into the a type a two, a pistol phaser where there's who knows, four, six, people debate how many were made, eight, we don't know, because right. um, uh, I don't believe there were just four. I, I, knowing how, I was lucky when I started um, in 2000, uh, I met Herb Solo. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, my secretary comes in, she said, there's a guy on the phone, he said he created Star Trek, he wants to talk to you. I said, if it's not Gene Roddenberry's ghost, I'm not interested, <laughs> right? And she's like, he's really adamant. Okay, ah, I created Star Trek. I know Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek. And he's like, you're wrong. You know, and it's just like, so I got this earful from Herb who became a really good friend, passed away last year, great guy. And uh, Herb took me into this rabbit hole and Matt Jeffries and Bob Justman and George Takai and Walter Koenig. And we just got the Dwyers, you know, John and his brother who were the set decorators. So I was fortunate to be at a time in Star Trek where I met the guys who actually were there. You know, and Matt Jeffries would tell the story that these sets were so cheap, uh, plywood, you know, the Enterprise, right. and, and N Nimoy would run down the hallway and the walls of the Enterprise would be collapsing, you know, and literally they tried to get the shot before the whole thing fell in, you know, it's, right. it's like, so when you asked your question, so when you talk to these guys um, who were there at the time, it's a very different story than what we make it today, because the one thing that I learned from all the Star Trek guys, there were no rules. Things broke, they fixed them. They ordered things one day, they changed things another day. There was no budget. It was constantly being reused. Right. You know, they were always being threatened with cancellation. Right. Kirk's tunics would get stripped and they'd go to a yeoman. You know, so like th everything was reused constantly. You know, it, it, you know, Shatner fluctuated in weight. We know that a lot. You know, he, he ate a lot. You know, it's like he always liked food. <laughs> he certainly looks different first season to third. Right. Those donuts, craft services. But, um, you know, so, um, you know, they were constantly changing his jerseys and, you know, the, his uniforms and they would go to somebody else. So I think that, like, again, when you can put something in, uh, you can match it to a specific scene in a TV show or movie, that's the highest form of value. Is that what makes the difference in terms of the, the phaser, either the, the Type 2 or the phaser rifle selling for 250, 615? as opposed to the jerseys, the, the shirts, the costumes selling for significantly less? I think that, like, like, let's take Captain Kirk. So you have three seasons of Star Trek, and you might have, I don't know, let's just say for the sake of argument, they had four per season. Let's say they had 12. Sure. Okay, of just the, the normal Starfleet tunic. That's not talking about the wraparounds right. or the mirror mirrors. Forget about all of those variants, right? Or, you know, so let's just talk about, let's say there's 12. Um, and um, maybe a few more because it was Captain Kirk. Let's say there's 15. How many could have survived? Let's get down to maybe there's five or six. Right. 
Um, again, I think what happens is, is that, you know, it's very hard to put together a landing party. And I think collectors kind of get discouraged and they go collect something else where when you get two guys putting together a landing party, which they'd want all the principal characters, those tunics should be a quarter of a million dollars. Right. They're that rare and they fluctuate that much. I mean, I sold a, um, a Nimoy velour uh, with Western costume labels, which is really uh, unusual because Bill Feist made most of the costumes. Um, it was one of the ones actually made at Western. Because of the provenance, I think we got $160,000 for it. Really? Yeah. So it just shows you, but because that it had an incredible history to it, and that will also drive the value forward. Well, it's interesting. I do want to talk about one costume that we did sell for a significant amount, and I want to get into the Superman costumes. That George Reeves costume is fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. And Azarian, that comes from Azarian, who had that on display in his home because he just liked to look at it, walk past <laughs> it, and know that he owned a thing that he could turn on the TV and watch. Yep. So I assume for you that's an incredible responsibility, selling something that belongs to a guy who so loved that thing, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, like you're talking about, like, passion that you can't even um, quantify. Right. You know, um, none of these collectors that I've met, like John, um, started out for money. It was pure passion. Sure. You know, they were kids who grew up watching these shows and reruns who were just obsessed. You know, we were all like, you know, I don't think John or I are old enough to have seen these in first generation to remember them, but we saw them in the 70s when they started coming out again. Mm -hmm. That's when we got introduced to, you know, Captain Kirk or Dr. Smith or Lost in Space and these things that we love. Um, yeah. And I think that, you know, like these, these guys collected because they just wanted it in their lives. You know, it meant something. That right. nostalgia is invaluable. So we had Chris Reeves, Kirk Allen, and George, uh, Chris Reeves, George Allen, uh, yeah. <laughs> Chris Reeves, George Reeves, Kirk Allen. Yes. They all did very, very well. Was there one that surprised you in terms of how well it did over any of the others? Because certainly the, uh, the Chris Reeves went for 187 right. from a movie that is not generally regarded as the best. Superman yeah, I would movie. say that, that, that this Chris Reeves, was a great costume. Great costume, terrible movie. Right, Superman so, 4. absolutely. Superman 4 was a terrible movie. But again, I think that you're looking at the lexicon of, of uh, Christopher Reeve. Sure, does, does that mean a part one, which was part one and two, basically were filmed simultaneously? So does that mean, I mean, what are those worth? Three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars 400000 right. It's hard to know anymore because collectibles – uh, since COVID mm -hmm. have just exponentially grown in value, you know, uh, across the board, I mean, every category. And uh, we're still, w I wrestle with this daily, like what things are worth because I don't know anymore. So that brings me to a question I was going to ask later, but I will bring it up now. So in the last year, certainly things, last couple of years, things have increased in price exponentially, as you put it. So I'm fascinated by how do you then sort of, estimate what will do well, when it will do well, when's the right time to sell, when it will, what it will sell for. Because certainly, were you worried about having three Superman costumes in the same sale? <laughs> well, as an auctioneer, you're always concerned about, you know, like doing the right thing for your client, right. you know, and making sure that, you know, enough people know about the auction. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I tell people, it's like having a wedding with two dysfunctional families getting married. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, and they each want 500 people and no one can agree on anything. And like, that's what, that's what the auction is, right? By the time you actually get this thing to, to Mike Sadler, <laughs> our auctioneer's hands, right? It kind of is like appropriate, right? So I think we, uh, you know, you go through all of that machinations and then, you know, um, you kind of sit there and the magic happens. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, and sometimes, you know, you, you get rewarded for your efforts. And, um, but I do think that we're in um, a new world of collecting where collecting now is mainstream. Um, it's no, it's even like the, the old days we used, it was cool. It's beyond that. You know, it, I don't, it's crossed into a new dimension of like acceptability. Like everybody's collecting. I was sure. at a dinner party the other night in Dallas and, you know, I was talking to the guy who invited me and he has five Les Pauls. You know, I was like, why do you collect them? I was just shocked, you know, and like and he's talking about six figure guitars and he just got hooked, you know, and it's just like when, you, when, when you're starting to see it at that level where it's not just the collector, where, where people now from outside of the hobbies are now getting interested in these fields and the material is finite, you're, the prices are going up because the, to somebody from the outside, these things still seem very affordable. You know. Well, it's interesting because we talk about 
different genres. We're talking about music. We're talking about entertainment. We're talking about television. We're talking about films. We're talking about things from the 30s, 40s, 50s. We're talking about current day, whether it's Marvel and DC. I am sort of interested in, in sort of the evolution of collecting in as much as that as shows get further, it used to be that shows kind of disappeared. Now everything's available on a streaming service. Lost in Space is available. Monsters is available. Things don't disappear anymore. Does that impact the interest in and value of those collectibles from those props, those costumes, given the fact that things that disappear, things that might have been forgotten or erased from the collective subconscious don't disappear anymore? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think the fact that we can go back and rewatch shows, I think that that also uh, invigorates collectors because they see things in the shows that we we'll, we'll get calls from collectors who are like, oh, that thing you have, you know, from you know Mission Impossible, it was actually used in Get Smart as well too, and these other four shows because these guys are rewatching these episodes constantly and seeing a lot of these props and costumes and set pieces are just reused. Like if it was an MGM piece, it could have been. I've sold things that were used in, you know. Um, uh, Citizen Kane that showed up on Star Trek. Right. You know, but literally set pieces that you could say, there it is in the Kane mansion, there it is on Star Trek and Plato's Retreat. Same piece, because it's been in the prop department all those years. Right. So there, that's an interesting thing too to watch. Well, you know, it, Lost in Space to me is a really interesting one because we had a lot of John Azarian, in the John Azarian collection, there were a lot of Lost in Space costumes. I did not necessarily think they would go for as high as they did. I don't know if you were surprised by it. I don't know if John was surprised by it. I get the sense that he was a little surprised. But it's interesting because that's a show that had a second life and a remake as well. Yes. So I wonder if that also impacts the interest in and value of, of those particular costumes. Or is it simply the fact that, hey, Bill Mooney wore this, Joan uh, June Lockhart wore, wore this, and that they are, in fact, so one of a kind. They are so colorful and identifiable with Lost in Space that that's why they did so well. I think Lost in Space has just been one of those TV shows that's been really undervalued. When I was, most of the tunics that John has were mine. I had probably 75 or 80% of those. They don't look like they would have fit you. Yeah. I was littler. <laughs> um, but um, Billy Mummy said the same thing when he looked at his. I couldn't fit in that. Um, but um, I was paying five or six thousand dollars a tunic in the day. Yeah. You know, 20 years ago, I had all of them. I loved them. Lost, I wasn't a Star Trek person, I was a Lost in Space person. Never really. There weren't a lot of collectors, and John became the guy, and he bought them all. He, he, he had the biggest – there's no one else that has – well, maybe a new person now, but before John, there was nobody else that had the depth of John and Lost in Space costumes. And I think that people are starting to realize that this was your chance. And if you, if you equate like that Christopher Reeve Superman for – Hundred and eighty thousand dollars and a you know Dr. Smith for say seventy-five thousand dollars. I don't know, the Dr. Smith still seems in you know relatively inexpensive. Right. Considering how cult it is. And it's just and that show just goes on and on and on. They don't go away, right? Um, so I think there's a lot of that. I mean, I was surprised that they sold for more than the Star Trek stuff. You're a lost in space guy, I'm a Star Trek guy. I would love to own an entire bridge crew collection. That is never gonna happen. But that said, I thought certainly somebody was out there because I know that their Lost in Space fans seem to be very, very rabid about that particular. And it, is it simply because there's only a limited amount of those as opposed to the Star Trek, which, as you said, Chekhov may wear the same thing. Sulu's wearing the same day as Kirk. I mean, that these things might have been interchangeable. But they were one shade as opposed to the really identifiable colors, the bright purples and yellows of the Lost in Space. Did that help make them sort of more iconic and significant? Yeah, probably for a while, I think maybe the Lost in Space people thought was a little bit not as cool, you know, where the Star Trek stuff was cooler looking. Right. And I could see I could see that going into it, you know, because they're just a different look. You know, one is much more sleek. One is much more 60s kind of reckoning to like that time period of Lost life. in Space stuff looks like it's dates from that period. Yes. Yeah. Very dated. Where Star Trek is could be any time period. Right. Um, yeah, I think I, I think that it's what exists. I mean, it always goes back to like what is out there, how much of this material exists, like what do you really know? How much what do we really know about how many of these costumes, how many Dr. Smiths are there? Are there five? Are there six? Are there eight? There aren't many. So you're talking about numbers that are under ten. Right. You know, or again, you go back to the fifty two mantle rookie card, even though how valuable it is, there's thousands of them. Dr. Smith tunics six, right. eight, you know, so it's just different. While we're on the subject of costumes, I do want to talk about uh, some stuff from earlier this year, the Monroe dresses. 
the bus stop dress, we talk about one of a kind. We talk about the mantle jersey. We talk yes. about a Marilyn Monroe dress. That bus stop dress did $399,000, I believe. Yeah, I think so. It did incredibly well. I'm assuming that certainly doesn't surprise you. It comes from a collector who certainly had amassed one of the greatest collections of, of, of golden age Hollywood wardrobes. And, you know, it's interesting to me when that when something like that comes, it's a thing I assume you still don't take for granted when you're offered something like that. Not Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. I mean, somebody the other day asked me, so when's your next Marilyn Monroe auction? And I said, maybe never. And the guy's like, why, why don't you have more dresses? I'm like, I think it's done. Really? I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, like we know where most of them are. Sure. Could there be a discovery? It's possible. Could, could one pop up here and there, but they're accounted for. We know where they went, you know? So like the, the like Gene London, whose collection we sold, um, Gene passed away sadly, and it was an amazing collector. And these were Gene's best Marilyn dresses. If Gene were, were alive, these would have never have been sold, right. you know? So it's like, and I told people when the these last Marilyn nurses came up, especially the bus top, I'm like, you're never gonna get one of these. I mean, this is, and to me that costume because of the Milton Green photo shoots of her in the gypsy costume, it's just, I don't know more perfect representation of a movie star than seeing Marilyn in that costume. How much do you think Madonna's connection to that bus stop costume had anything to do with its final sale price, given the fact that she'd worn it in for a Truth or Dare poster and in a Vanity Fair photo shoot as well? I would say none. Really? Uh, that was the debate was, I took it out of the catalog, and everybody's like, you got to put it back in. And I'm like, mm. I mean, that's like, I didn't even want it mentioned. Really? Yeah, I, just, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm a purist. I just think it was like, some people should should Madonna have actually even worn it. It's like <laughs> I don't know. You can, it's a whole well, I mean, it's a whole different conversation, right? Should somebody should I have held a phaser rifle? Right. Probably not. Right, 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 right. William right. Shatner should have been there going whenever. Right. So it's like you know, but when you like, I feel like there are things that are fun, and there are things that you actually have to realize that you have to have some reverence for because this is Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. You know, it's like you're talking about a cultural icon of on a on a level that there is no other. Right. I mean, sure there's Elvis and sure there's James Dean and sure there's, you know, Michael Jackson, but they're not Marilyn Monroe. You know, it's just like, it's just, and her, and her persona just grows and grows and grows. And I, and it's remarkable to me. So when you, when you get to handle things like that, you really sit, stop for a minute and realize that, you know what, this is, really once in a lifetime. Well, there was also the, the seven year it's dress was in that auction did very, very well. Um, the self portrait is a thing that I keep coming back to. It was one of my favorite things in the entire auction because that's something she drew that had been something that had been auctioned for charity. Lawrence Olivier had in fact auctioned it off. I, I sort of do wonder as well when something like that comes available, you know, when that whole collection comes available, how, auction and all that stuff was there and then knowing that one day this stuff will all be scattered yet again and what that's like for you uh it's rewarding in the aspect that like when i started when i entered this field um it was didn't exist um and i had this uh, idea that there that there should be some custodial responsibility for preserving hollywood because i thought it was important and nobody seemed to agree with me. Um, Why is that? It was looked at as a bunch of junk. Really? Yeah. I mean, when, when Debbie Reynolds, when she went to the MGM auction, Hedda Harper, who was a famous journalist, wrote mm. an article in the LA Times that said, crackpot Debbie Reynolds is at the MGM <laughs> auction. This headline, spending all of her money. She spent $600,000. That was the headline. Okay. And so when you start thinking about, like, you had a handful of visionaries in the 70s who maybe five or six of them, who thought enough to preserve these things. And then you had the pause between the 70s and the mid-90s when Planet Hollywood came into the scene and really popularized the idea of movie memorabilia more so than, more so than television and kind of spawned the field. Right? You had these moments, these 70 and 95, you had these early 90s, you had these touchstone moments. But when you kind of look at the, the like the importance of like the ruby slippers of these things, they are important because of what they represent to people. The ruby slippers represent hope, right? Anybody who sees the ruby slippers is just in awe of them. 
because of what they represent, not because of what they are. Sure. And that's what this is all about. These are, these are our dreams, our memories. Um, and you know, and to me, it was always about like the connection from literature, from whence these amazing stories came from, and learning about that side of the the, the, the story and the transition to a motion picture. You know, it's just kind of like once you get that bug, it's it's unbelievable. It is interesting, you know, standing in front of a lot of this stuff, you know, whether I was standing next to Groucho Marx's glasses or his jacket from the day at the races, these are movies I've seen a thousand times. Somebody I, I, I adore, I, 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 someone whose who's things I want to be near, but it's not because they wore them. It's not because it's about what they represented, right? It's yeah. about the fact that they amused, entertained. And, and got me through tough times. I mean, Millions that's kind of, of what people. You, yeah, that's kind of what these are about. So it's all about, it's all about nostalgia. I mean, we all have a moment in time where I remember being a little kid and The Wizard of Oz would come on television. It was, I seem to remember it being around Thanksgiving and it was once a year, you know, no VHS. You had one shot to watch right. it, right? You were glued. Nobody would talk. It was like a thing, right? You'd wait to go to the bathroom. It's like, you couldn't miss it because you'd wait a year. So I think that like growing up with that, and you look back and it's like, you remember these things. I remember my son was, I don't know, like 10 or something. He was really sick, had the flu and uh, called me up and he's like, you know, I need DVDs. I'm so bored. I said, I, there's DVDs like in, in it, it, you watch anything you want. So two hours later, he called me back and goes, I just watched the greatest new show. Oh my God, it's so amazing. You have to come home and watch it. I'm like, what was it? He goes, HR Puffin stuff. So good. I'm like, <laughs> I just couldn't stop laughing. It's just like, so for him, right. it was brand new. Mm -hmm. Right, Lidsville. Like he, like he went down the rabbit hole that I went down. You know, with H.R. Puff and stuff and the Crofts, and 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 it was and to me, it was like that's what this is about. When you reintroduce it, when somebody sees, you know, Jimmy Stewart, it's a wonderful life. When somebody sees these movies for the first time, you know, and they're like, oh my god, you know, it's like, it, and I think then then you you carry that out into collecting. Somebody asks, Steve asks here in the Q and A, and by by all means, feel free to ask Joe questions. Uh, anything on Disney animation or props that you would like to comment on? Well, the Disney market has, again, grown significantly. I mean, animation for years was kind of dead. Um, Heritage and Jim Lentz, who's our animation expert, has really revitalized the field. Um, the Disney costumes, uh, that, so if you go back in time, um, when Eisner was running the studios, eBay had just started, so they, Disney started an online store and they started selling everything out of their archives, a complete Captain Jack Sparrow costume. They were selling everything, right? Because Eisner, we got to get into this business. Then all of a sudden, a year later, they're like, uh-oh, we're depleting the archives. Stop. Right. <laughs> you know. So there are Disney treasures that made it out into the market that are invaluable. I had the the ghost from the haunted mansion. I had the three ghosts at one time that were, you know, full size. And, you know, Again, I think Disney crosses the boundaries, whether it's from the theme park, which is a specific collector. Mm -hmm. Which theme we park had an earlier this year that's remarkably well. Hugely popular. People want to ride in one, want one of the cars or one of the vehicles or, you know, like the, the posters from the theme park, hugely collected. And then you have Disney animation cells, pick your favorite movie. Or now you cross over and what Disney made, whether it's Mary Poppins or 20,000 Leagues or Tron or, you know, their, 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 their base of, and now obviously with all this, what they've acquired with Fox and Marvel, mm -hmm. they have everything. But if you go back to the core of what Disney was, yeah, I think Disney's another uh, uh, entity that will always increase in value and there'll be always more and more people wanting to buy it. And we do have the animation sales starting on Friday. Yeah, amazing stuff. A lot stuff. of sales from that. Amazing stuff. In fact, I believe we we'll also have a really, really significant uh, Mickey Mouse sale coming up uh, later, ne earlier next year. Yeah, and we so. have the and we have the anime sale. Right, there's anime this week, right. tenth and tenth through thirteenth, anime and animation. And anime is another one for years was kind of like even the stepchild to animation. Now anime has gone crazy. Yeah, because people more because again, why the kids who watched it have grown up. They have money. They're buying their nostalgia. Right. That's what this is about. So their lexicon, how they look at popular culture is anime. It keeps changing. Miyazaki, certainly the fact that the director coming out of retirement made some great films. Certainly there's a lot of Miyazaki stuff in this auction. Brilliant. It'd like, be like having Kurosawa come back. You know, like you're talking about monumentally important. So somebody asks here, thoughts about the overall price trends in movie posters? 
You know, your cat. We should say you may you may not be the you you certainly know the subject. You have a lot of stuff in your auction, but certainly yeah, yeah. I've collected movie posters yeah. for years. I'm I'm, I'm pretty well versed on right. it. They have been pretty consistent. I would say that what I have seen in talking to Gray yeah. Smith, who runs our movie poster division, um, the super high quality. Um, they had a um, Invasion of the Saucer Man half sheet, which is a really good poster. Um, and uh, that's the, the the one with the kind of the rays going down. Right. They had a mint one, and it sold for $50,000. It's like a $15,000 half sheet. When you're getting into that exceptional quality, unrestored, I think movie posters still have a long way to go because when you can get things that are unrestored, right. that are really perfect, they're still grossly undervalued because, again, restoration of movie posters is acceptable. But, again, when you get a Forbidden Planet one sheet that's not on linen, that has incredibly bright colors, that only has fold lines, leave it alone. Right. Because you're talking about there aren't many left. So I think movie posters, again, have a long way to go, but I think it's, you know, you're going to see trends. Right now, 50 science fiction is really hot again. It got soft for a while. Horror but, as well. Yeah. It Universal goes, horror is a big, big huge. player in the movie poster world. Universal horror drives the train and posters by by a long shot. I mean, it, the value is we had a Wolfman one sheet in my last auction. I think it sold for 130,000 hammer. So 160,000, whatever that is. Um, but, and, and that is the last of the great universal horror movies, you right. know, the, with Dracula and mummy being the front end of those equations. So yeah, I think movie posters are another one that are, uh, I'm buying them. And we should say also that what's really fascinating to me is the original art for those movie posters, that Bob Peak Apocalypse Now that we sold recently, there will be more Bob Peaks coming up. I love the fact that people buy the original, that, that we make that available. I mean, it is the equivalent of our American art or illustration art. This is- Absolutely. It's a remarkable art form. And we're talking about, when you, if you wanna get into the rare factors, movie poster artwork, we had in our auction, uh, the Fort Apache, John Wayne. Right. We had the one sheet. We had the top of it, the battle scene with Custer, um, you know, uh, fighting. And uh, the painting, I think, opened at 20000 and hammered at 95000 um, It's a testament to, A, the rarity, and B, collectors realizing that this stuff is really important. I mean, can you imagine owning the original art for the thing that became mass manufactured? Yeah. Right, that's kind of what makes it appealing, right? You own that's the one of one. Millions and millions of people have your copy, right? Right. So it's like if you have that one sheet artwork to, you know, you know, um, Apocalypse Now. It wasn't the famous poster; it was the European poster. So that would mean that if you had the famous one, the one we all know, what's that worth? Right. Five million dollars? It should be. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. That that's the thing that that I I think will in time become one of the more popular or coveted forms right it is now i mean yeah. the, the growth in original artwork that became movie posters is grown tenfold you certainly see in comics you certainly no reason not to see expected in movies as well everywhere yeah you know i do want to get back to to costumes real quick and as much as that you know we talked about monroe we talked about star trek lost space we just sold that stallone jacket i think that's for the second time right yes it's significantly more the first second time than the first time which yeah. Speaks, yeah, which speaks to what the popularity of the the impact of the 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 last couple of years. Did that surprise you? Uh, how well the Stallone jacket did? The Rocky no, jacket. no, that was when I when the 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 guy who owned the Stallone jacket is a dear friend, a long term client of both of our companies, and uh, he had bought a lot of uh, Stallone items. And we were talking on the phone, and I said to him, "I think it's a really good time to sell." Really? Well, why? He had never, he, he wanted to exhibit them. He never got around to doing it. So he had them and they, you know, he wasn't really doing much with them, okay. except he loved them. And he asked me what I thought about the market. And I said, you know, I, I, my gut tells me these are going to do really well. And that's all I can tell you is if I didn't think that I would tell you, I think this is a good time. And we were right. I think when the Rocky jacket sold here, I think it brought 147,000 the first time. And I think we got 360,000 mm -hmm. uh, the second time. Um, you know, you can put, you know, you can, uh, it probably is the combination of both of our clients coming together. So you have two companies now where, you know, we kind of dominated the field, bringing all of our tens of thousands of clients into this who've never bought before from Heritage right. and the Heritage people who've never bought from Profiles. So it's created a good, um, you know, mixture. Good synergy. Good synergy. Good synergy. 
I want to talk about also when you talk about friends of yours. Kevin Burns was a friend as well, and we certainly auctioned up his uh, monsters collection. Um, it's interesting to me the stuff they did well again was the original art, the Basil Gogos. Unbelievable, right? Those model kits, those Aurora model kits. So we right. had one lot. We had twenty of the original kits and original uh, uh, cellophane. They were like forty six thousand right. dollars. But it's like again. But they're cool. Like, like you know, th when you think about like what an awesome thing it is to have all of them at once. So there's again people like you get a chance to buy them all together. But again, Kevin Burns is a perfect example. Well, like an amazing collector, but like a, a legend in Hollywood. You know, this is a guy who you know was you know represented the Irwin Allen estate who got the new star, uh, the new Lost in Space movie on Netflix TV show. You know, made and you know we're on, now we're in season three. And you know, just he created ancient aliens and the girls next door with Hefner. And you know, Kevin was a just a great guy, and this was his hobby. You go over to his house, and you know, he want to eat, you know, fruit fruit. <laughs> Seriously, this would be a thing. You know, you'd, you'd get some really bad sugary cereal, <laughs> watch the monsters, and geek out. You know, yeah. and it was just like, and that's what this is about. So. Um, it just, you know, is we lost Kevin, and it was, you know, um, and you know, way too young, um, and it just, you know, the opportunity again. I felt, an, uh, I felt more responsibility for Kevin's material than John's. Yeah, you know, John is a dear friend, but uh, losing Kevin was a big one. You know, and it's just like when you when and when somebody like that leaves your life, um, I really felt an enormous responsibility to do as best as we could with the volume. Of what he had, you know, that was even more amazing. Right, every game, every action figure, every kind of every game. Right, <laughs> forget every game. But the, the interesting thing, the paintings did really well. Yes. Again, that goes back to the original art. Yeah, and it sort of is sort of emblematic. When people think of the auction world, they often think of art as being that central thing. Here at Heritage, obviously, it's coins, comics, art, and entertainment, and so forth. Forty-one categories, if not more. But that art keeps coming back because it's the thing I guess people can display. They have a fond memory of that that uh, that cover of Famous Monsters. I mean, I assume that there's any number of reasons that can explain it. The coloring book cover for the Munsters, or like you know, like the you know, or the Aurora model kit artwork for the Munsters, uh, you know, at Christmas or by the fireplace. So again, you're 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 crossing generations. So you're crossing somebody who grew up with that, who probably had that model kit or that game, right? And then who now collects something else. And again, when you're talking about one of a kind, that's it. You don't buy it, you don't get another one. Right. It's not like the model kit. So yeah, the artwork really performed. Um, I, I was surprised, but what it brought it was, I mean, I felt justified in the sense that it did what it was supposed to because it was that good. And right. Kevin had all of it. You know, it's like, like that, what he had, nobody else has. So that, like this was a collection that technically never would have been sold. You know, so it was not for sale. Right. I do want to get to music. We got a couple things on the table I want to talk about, but we got. I want to get to music. We talked about movie posters. Music posters is certainly something that has utterly fascinated me. I collect. That's one thing I actually do collect. You go to concerts. I want that poster. I've been collecting them since I was ripping things down from <laughs> phone poles when I was a kid at punk rock shows. Um, we have the auction record a tie for the Hank Williams and the Beatles. Beatles Shea Stadium just caught up to the Hank Williams final show that he didn't attend and, and the uh, New Year's Eve show that he died before he got to. That Beatles at Shea Stadium just sold for 150, only a few of them known to exist. How much does the fact that something like Get Back now being out there and the fact that people have dived back into the Beatles for the nine hours or 18 hours or however many times they choose to watch it is going to impact their interest in and the value of Beatles collectibles. We have John Lennon's glasses sitting in front of us from an auction just a few days ago. It wasn't even in a signature auction. It was in a showcase at right. 57500 because they belonged to a producer of the Mike Douglas show to whom Lennon gifted them. That's, that's them right here. I don't even want to touch them. <laughs> Somebody bought them. <laughs> They're gone. I don't want to touch them. They're sold. They're sold. Um, but I do want to talk about what that impact of Get Back is going to have on Beatles collectibles for the next, for the foreseeable future. The Beatles, nine hours or whatever it is, is a different animal because Peter Jackson made something where you are literally with, with the Beatles. Mm -hmm. You're not watching some um, TV show or series that's been created you're there you're in the room right 
you're with John and Yoko and Paul and like just sitting there watching the dynamic and seeing how kind of John Lennon now is not the alpha anymore. He was for years. Right. It, was the, it was the Beatles with John's band, right? So people, you're either a John or Paul guy. I'm a John guy. Most I'm, I'm Paul. I think is great, but I'm a John Lennon. I've become a Paul guy after Get Back. Yeah, me too. But it's interesting because I had a different appreciation for him, watching him compose on the fly, seeing like where his head was at in terms of the conversations he had with John. But for a minute, we're voyeuristically in it, right? You know. So yeah, I would think that the Beatles material rightly so should go up a lot because again you're talking about it's the beatles there there, there is no beatles light it's the beatles right, right? so i think that in, in their autographs they're still yeah there are lots of them but they're still undervalued for what they are for for the life-changing moment when, when they go up on that rooftop and you experience that moment you want to own something right it's just it's in you it's like oh my god i want something i want a piece of that you know it's funny, those posters, too. I mean, the, there's only a handful of those. We keep talking about one, two, three, four, five of a thing. And, and things tend to reveal themselves after an auction, right? So there's a one one poster that sells for 150. People are like, oh, wait, I think I have one of those hanging in the dining room. We're getting into the Shea Stadium poster. <laughs> a perfect one. It'll be the best one we ever sell. Really? It'll, it's, it'll, it, it's, it'll probably be the highest grade. So we'll sell that next year. But that's... It, the auction and the combination of it brings material out. Right. People have them that are just like, hmm, maybe it's time. Two hundred thousand dollars for a poster is life changing. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially if it's been hanging in the dining room and you completely forgot about it. Absolutely. You can go out and buy a replica for a couple bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike say the Michael Jackson shoes sitting just behind us. Those <laughs> those stage warns you can't uh, get anywhere else. No, there that it's done. You know, I want to talk about while we're on the subject. Austin's Don't Look Back, which right. did really, really well. It had been sitting in the original artist's bedroom underneath a sheet for 25 years. I think album art is probably the next area that's going to explode. This weekend, I'm picking up, which we haven't announced yet, but I'll give you guys a, a moment of something amazing. Tupac Shakur, we're getting um, uh, Machiavelli, the artwork of him on the cross, he went into the studio, saw the artist, make the artwork approved it, and he died two days later. So we're getting the artwork to that cover. Wow. You're talking about, I've mentioned it to people who are from that genre, and they're like, it's defining that album, that moment right. in time. So that piece of artwork, could it bring a million dollars? It could. I mean, so I think album artwork of things like that, you're going to see contemporary art prices. Because that's crossing over. Right. Like the, the movie production artwork is still in a genre. The album artwork will cross over. It's universal. Sure. You know, it's so I think that it's a very undervalued area, but the material is rare. I mean, it's not like you're going to see much of it. So if you see something you like, buy it because you're not going to probably get a chance. You know, that's, that's the other thing about it. there's not much of it out there. Right. Scott asks you the question I'm sure you've been eagerly anticipating. What is your perspective on the emergence of the NFT? Because <laughs> you're a man who likes to hold stuff. Yeah, I mean, so like the NFT thing is interesting. I've had lots of conversations with very intelligent people about what an NFT actually is, as opposed to like a, a Webster's definition of it. If you look at an NFT in its purest sense, it's a, a way to authenticate something mm -hmm. okay so if you have uh, a, a captain kirk phaser rifle and you have an nft that directs you to a source of origin of ownership i think there's value you know in that pathway mm -hmm. um it's i don't still understand the 70 million dollar beeples <laughs> i mean there are people who think it's worth 300 million dollars right i don't quite get it you know um I haven't gotten there yet. Um, I finally have come around to Bitcoin and under, I, I feel a lot better with cryptocurrency. I actually bought some. Um, so, um, but I'm the NFT thing, I think will become something. I don't know what it's going to become. But it's a very different kind of collector, right? I mean, it's funny. There was just yeah. that piece about the NFT collector who went to Miami and saw real art and went, oh, hey, this is not what I expected. It's though there's some real disconnect in some ways between the digital collector and the tangible collector. 
where <laughs> it's what is it, Joe Walsh Analog Man Digital? What's the what's the song? Right, right. Right. It's like that's Robert. We're the we're with that we're there. Right. It's like you know we're the analog guys. It's like you know you know so they left us in the dust. Um, uh, I own a few Top Shots. That's about as far as I go. But still, that's tied to something else. You know, I mean, at least that's tied to a. You can watch it. You know, you can quantify it. But I still, I never look at them. But you could. But I, yeah. But I look at my comic books. I look at my yes, move my yes, posters. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I like the thing, the thing that I can look at, hold, and show. But you can't look at a Bitcoin. I don't own any Bitcoin. It's, you do. It's you're... code. And it's code and a little. Uh, it, you're buying invisible code in an invisible wallet. Right. <laughs> That's right. It's either the greatest gimmick in the world. Spirits in the material world. Right. It, it's spirits in the material world. So, um, I still don't have a an opinion yet on NFTs. I would say uh, proceed with caution. Um, don't bet the farm on them. <laughs> and um, you know, we're all going to learn on that one. Right. Brad asks, where are uh, where are you saying the greatest loss of momentum? I hear that interest in Elvis is way, way, way down lately. You know, I would agree with you, Brad. I mean, I was first of all, I would westerns, war movies have kind of faded away. Uh, even the great comedians, W. C. Fields, Arbuckle, even Chaplin to some extent, um, Gene Harlow, Veronica Lake. Is I mean, that because they're what, what? To what do you ascribe that? I mean. We talked a moment ago about the fact that everything is available to stream, but certainly there are things. Patty Arbuckle is a whole different case. Or, right. You know, that's there's a whole um, infamy that goes along with that. But Chaplin intrigues me, or, or you know, I was also surprised that some of the Marx Brothers stuff didn't do as well as I thought it would. I just think that generationally there are more things to watch, and it's just not as cool as what's available now. I so mean, it's, it's cooler just... to own a Thor hammer than Groucho's glasses. Today, yeah, yeah. Will it in two hundred years? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it'll be different. Uh, but I think in the moment, the Thor hammer is way cooler. Today, it uh, doesn't mean it's more important. Um, but I do think that you know you're seeing a lot of shifts in the market. You're seeing what I'm most surprised at is eighty and nineties movies. Oh my God, the interest is massive. Sure, yeah, you know, because aliens, people like me are showing their kids that stuff. Predator, Commando. The Matrix. I mean, you're you're dealing with things now that like legions of collectors, Back to the Future, that you know that that are driving prices to the stratospheric right. level. Die Hard. All of that. All 80s and 90s, you know, action adventure movies are driving the market. here so people can look ah there we go john wants to know what is your opinion on original art for magic the gathering cards you know um one of the departments here at heritage that i oversee is trading card games uh so it's actually something that i have a, quite a bit of interest in um you know i think it's still again very undervalued i think any of the artwork from magic Yu-Gi-Oh, pokemon where you can buy something that is from the alpha set or a beta set of magic where you have one of those key card artwork um i think is grossly undervalued i mean i i think again if something had the ability to grow exponentially it's those because millions of people play the games millions of people play magic millions of people play Yu-Gi-Oh, millions of people play pokemon so if you had the original alpha uh, artwork for the black lotus god it'd bring a million bucks right now so, so, you know, I think that I would, I'm a big believer in trading card games as a genre and I'm a big believer, especially in the artwork. Were you all, when did you become a big believer in the trading card game? Because that's certainly not a thing that was present in the market when you got into this. Um, 1990 something, I was in Japan and my son was little and he was hooked on Pokemon. So I brought back boxes of Pokemon, uh, from Tokyo and, um, kind of went down the rabbit hole and he um became a player right so i i, I got i got interested in that, that world because my just learned it through attrition almost and yeah. um, you know and now have seen the massive popularity our, our video, our angle keeps shooting. I don't think people want to look at me, so I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to put it on you. I'll get the light. It's a little bit of behind.
Uh, there okay. we go. All right. So, so yes, I mean, you know, so when you are buying and selling at auction, there's going to be a time period you're going to have to wait because there are fees. It's like buying a stock. Yeah. You know, there's fees with everything. So I think our fees are, if you were to come on the other side of heritage and see the 750 employees here <laughs> and the vast size of this campus, you'd understand why we have fees. Right. Before we wrap up, I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the Neil Sean auction and the Elton John piano, because certainly musical instruments have been a big part of Heritage's history. Sure. In the last year, we've had two of our biggest, the Neil Sean, uh, and there's going to be more to come in the coming year. Yes. So talk to me about the the Elton John piano. We can we can say that the, the Elton John piano and the Neil Sean Don't Stop Believing guitar were both bought by Jim Irsay. He made that very public. He's putting together a, a collection for a museum one day. But certainly to see that Elton John Steinway go for $915,000 must have been incredibly rewarding. Was it surprising? No, because if you think of like what the piano was. so The one he toured with for decades. Decades. And, and, and like impeccable provenance, a letter from Steinway talking about when they manufactured it, when it was delivered to him, letters from the piano tech, and it was used at Live Aid, and Freddie Mercury played it, and Paul McCartney played right. it, and he used it at Dodger Stadium, Elton John. I mean, this was the piano. It'd be like having, you know, you know, Paul's famous, you know, bass. Right. You know, like it's it's – it's the you know, it's Elton John, Eric Clapton's Black Beauty. I mean, it's the one, right? right. So yeah, and this it, again, it's a it's a it's a giant piano. It's the huge concert grand. It's big. He signed it. I think it's fourteen feet long. It's huge. Right. Um, so yeah, and again, it, it, it's a testament to Mr. Elton John's career, his popularity. So I always uh, you know equate that where the good guys win. <laughs> so I was happy to see that. Um, Neil Schoen, um That was an interesting one because I remember calling up Robert one day and I'm like. You'll call me at 11 o'clock last night. And Robert said to me, this was the 1970s and you were a girl. Right. And Neil calls you at 11 o'clock. Well, you were night. my next door neighbor, Greg, who <laughs> when we, I texted Neil and I said, I'm, I showed him something that Greg had collected of Neil's. I said, send a picture of it to Neil. And Greg was like, you just texted Neil Sean. Right, I'm right. like, yes. So I had, a, it took me a moment to pause and be like, yeah, it's like, it's surreal because you, you get to know these people in a different way. Right. You know, you become friends, you know, and it's just like, you get to see like uh, their life, right. you know? And it was like, we went to uh, Northern California and went to Neil's um, facility and he had a thousand guitars, a thousand guitars. That's a lot. I mean, you, you can't even, but you, room after room. But I mean, when you see the sheer volume, it's hard to fathom. And he knew every single guitar. Yeah, he knew it, but how they've been changed, how they've been altered, how they sound. Where he played yeah. it, who gave, oh, can't sell. No, no, that was a gift from right. somebody in 83. That was a deal. You know, no, I can never sell that one. And it was just like, how do you know this? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, but every, and then the coolest part though for me was, being in his facility, and then we, we picked out like 50 guitars, and Neil gave me a hard time because he wasn't able to tune them, so he had to play them out of tune. He'll forever give me grief because he played out of tune guitars, but he did really well. And he would sit there and just plug them in, and he'd be, and he'd be like, this is really good, man. And he'd be like, yeah, this, and then, yeah, this doesn't sound that good. And it was just like watching that. Right. I was like, that was the greatest concert I've ever been to. I, and people, What's the greatest concert? Me and Neil, Gary and Aaron watching Neil Schoen plugging in guitars and just riffing and talking about like how the guitar felt and right. you could see the twinkle in his eye. You know, it was like that was cool. Well, we have reached an hour. It doesn't feel like it. I do appreciate everybody who stuck around and asked some very good questions. You have an auction coming up to begin the year. The consignment deadline is when? Auctions February twenty second. So uh, early February twenty first. Yeah, February twenty first. You know. <laughs> Depends on marketing wants the catalog. Um, it's going to be Star Trek, yeah. uh, mostly uh, TOS, original series. Uh, we have uh, almost a complete landing party. Uh, great Kirk. Uh, we have the Kirk and Spock from Mirror Mirror. I think we have a Sulu from Mirror Mirror. But we have a, a, all the characters, uh, in-depth uh, pants. And then we have some surprises from some of the later uh, Star Trek uh, uh, movies and TV shows. But again, as good as Azarian was for Lost in Space, this collection is equally as good for Star Trek. The quality of these tunics is extraordinary. I'm very excited to uh, look at them. Halloween. <laughs> there you go. 
Thanks to everybody who watched. Uh, Joe, if they have questions, want to get a hold of you, want to consign something, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, you can call jm at ha.com or my extension is 1511. Um, we're easy to find. And, you know, whatever field it is, we can help you with. If we, even if we have to direct you to a different department or something, just let us know what you have. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate you watching. Joe, thanks for doing this. Sure. Thanks.